G'day, I'm Paul. Sangyong is probably a brand that you've never really heard of, but if you're in the market for a seven seat SUV that is off-road capable, the Sangyong Rexton may be the answer to your problem. This right here is the top specification Sangyong Rexton Ultimate. It competes with things like the Mitsubishi Pajero Sport, the Isuzu MUX, the Ford Everest. There's a few off-road focused seven seat SUVs in that segment. This one here, top spec is priced at just under $55,000, but if that's too expensive, the entire range starts off at just under $48,000. Today we're going to do a detailed review of this car. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes up on the screen or you can scroll down below if you're on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, I'd love it if you could subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. That's going to tell you every single time we drive cars that you've never heard of. Now, before we get into the design and talking about this car in particular, I just want to caveat the review by saying that Sangyong as a brand is currently bankrupt. So at the time of filming this, they're looking for a new owner. So before you buy one of these, I would highly recommend just checking up on that and seeing where they're at before you commit your money to the brand. Now, you've got six external colors to pick from. All but white are an additional $500. This car's recently received a facelift, so you can see some changes to this bottom end down here. Overall, I think it's an impressive looking car. I mean, it doesn't look Look, you know, when you think Sangyong, you think, uh, you know, the, the old Rexton, the old Stavik, and some of the random things they've produced in the past. But you can see here that they've gone to a lot of effort to modernize this and give it a premium look. It's got a big, bold grill up the front there. And then over to the side, you've got fog lamps down the bottom here, and then full LED headlights with an LED daytime running light, and these brushed aluminium garnishes around the outer edge of the grille. Around the side here, you've got a set of 20 inch alloy wheels and they're chrome. I haven't seen chrome wheels on a car for a little while. That's all offset with some garnish here around the wheel arches. I did notice as well while sitting here that there's a shadow being cast over this panel that kind of has an overbite to the front bumper. So a little bit disappointing. We'll keep an eye on the rest of the car to see if that trend continues or whether that's just limited to this section of the car. Up the top here, you have a 360 camera. This is where one of the cameras sits in that wing mirror, and then an indicator built into the wing mirror. You get a chrome garnish that runs all the way down the side of the car. Privacy glass, roof rails, and then if you whip around to the rear, around here you've got a set of LED tail lights. These actually look pretty cool at night time. They've gone to a lot of effort there to give this just a little bit of character while it's out on the road. And then you've got four-wheel drive badge here to signify that this is indeed a four-wheel drive version of the Rexton. So we are inside the Rexton. Let's start off with the key. So you've got lock, unlock, a button to switch on the headlights, a panic button, and then a boot button. On the back of it, you have the Sangyong logo. It's quite a heavy key. It's got these sort of metal bits on the side and it's a proximity sensing key with the push button just in here. So this is the ultimate, which means it is the bee's knees when it comes to the Rexton range. And you can kind of tell they've put a lot of effort into this. You've got the Nappa leather seats. These sort of feel high end and premium. Nappa leather is generally uh, designated for more premium Euro models. So it's good to see that they've um, slapped it into here. You've got this stitching along the dashboard there with that leather material. I think this looks really nice and then you've got soft touch materials sort of along the top of this cowl here and then uh, they sort of get a little firmer here in the center of the car but for the most part I think it's a nicely presented interior and they've just gone to a lot of effort to make you feel like you are getting you know the top end model in the range now what about your touch points they are really nice so the center console here where you rest your elbow it's nice and soft as is the armrest on the door as well. How soft is it? Well, we've tested the surfaces with our durometer. And if you want to see how this car compares to other cars that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description. Now, build quality. We did notice at the front there that sort of bumper was a little weird. Um, this is kind of loose here, but for the most part, it feels okay. Okay, let's talk infotainment. So you get an eight inch infotainment unit as standard. It looks kind of strange in that place. I'd love to see a much bigger screen in here and it's fairly basic in terms of its operation. So you get AM and FM radio, there's no digital radio, but you do get the ability to connect a smartphone through a cable. So it comes with both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like to start with. So full screen, and it's nice and fast as well. You can see it sort of zips through those menus. There's no inbuilt satellite navigation, so you do have to have your phone paired if you do want to use satellite navigation. I'll show you what Android Auto looks like. So again, full screen integration, and then fairly quick as well. Now, keep in mind that both of these are available with voice recognition here on the steering wheel. When you use that, it actually sends the commands through the cloud, so you get a lot more accuracy in terms of processing. You can send text messages, make phone calls, uh, play music, 
all that kind of thing is done through your voice recognition system and then processed by the phone through the cloud. Now, in terms of safety technology, you have autonomous emergency braking. You've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror, lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant. You also have rear cross traffic alert. It is a bit disappointing though. You only have standard cruise control, even on the top spec model here, there's no radar cruise control. In terms of parking, you have front and rear parking sensors and then a 360 degree camera. I'll show you what that looks like. One push of this. Um, so it's interesting, the camera is actually pretty decent quality. So there's your top down view. That one's a little grainy, but you can see here from the front view that it's quite a sharp image. You can then select a number of different views. So this is the right hand side of the car. I don't know why you would want to see the right hand side of the car. I have a feeling that should be the left hand side, uh, simply because this was probably left hand drive and they just forgot to to make that happen. Uh, you can though go to a wide view and then an ultra wide view as well. Then they've got this 3D mode as well that allows you to sort of see from the, the back looking down, which I think is kind of interesting as well. Now there is one curious thing. There's a button here that I, I honestly don't know what it does. I know I'm meant to be the car expert, but I don't know. I've tried researching this and I've got no idea what this button does. When you push it, nothing happens. Uh, there's no manual inside the car. There is a manual on here, but it's just for the infotainment system. Um, if you know what this button does, let us know in the comments section below and how do you activate it if it actually does anything. Okay, let's talk practicality and we'll start with our connectivity. So down the front here, you have two USB-A ports. One is for the uh, smartphone mirroring and then the other is for charging. Both will charge though. And then in the center console here, you have a 12 volt outlet. And in terms of storing your phone, you have a wireless phone charger down the front here. So you can just slide your phone onto that. It'll begin charging. We can pop your phone over here as well. Coffee cup fits nicely into here. No dramas there at all. Same with our water bottle. We've got teeth on the side there that hold it in nicely. And then inside the door that fits in beautifully. And then finally, our big water bottle kind of fits into there, but you've got to actually, no, if you go sideways, it fits in nicely. Then in terms of other storage, you've got a center console here that's fairly deep. I'll give you an idea of how deep that is. There you go, it sort of just sits under the rim there. And then finally, a glove box that you can easily fit your bottle plus other odds and ends into. Moving on to comfort, you have dual zone automatic climate control. You have heated and cooled seats for the front row, plus a heated steering wheel as well. I mentioned earlier that the seats are Nappa leather, so pretty cool design as well. You can see the perforations there for the cooling. Um, they hug you in nicely too, so they're nice and comfortable. You have electric seat adjustment plus memory as well. Then in terms of your steering wheel, it has both tilt and reach adjustment. And finally, our reach test. Let's see how this goes. Good, it's all easy to reach from the driver's seat. Second row of the Rexton, what's it like back here? Um, look, actually a little less leg room than I thought there'd be. So yeah, I have my driver's seat pretty far back, but given the size of this thing, I'm sort of kind of wedged up against the front seat there. Toe room is okay, um, headroom is pretty reasonable. Uh, in terms of the other features you get down here, you have a 12 volt outlet, two USB chargers, a little storage slot down there, air vents, map pockets in the back of the seats. There is an interesting function here that we've seen on other Korean cars, and that's the ability to move the passenger seat from the second row. Kind of strange feature. I don't really understand why they include all that stuff. It would just get annoying if your kids play with that all the time. Um, second row has a armrest here with two cup holders plus a phone holder, and then just a little port here with storage for odds and ends will hopefully fit our cup, oh, sorry, our bottle rather, nice and easily. And we'll try our big bottle inside the door as well. Kind of fits in if you squeeze it in, but it's not really too snug of a fit. Now, before I show you the third row, I forgot to mention that there is heated seats for your second row as well for the outboard seats, which is pretty good. So getting into the third row requires you to drop this and then pull another lever, which brings the second row forward. It's on a little hydraulic arm, so that means it'll stay out of position. I did find though when this seat was a little further back that it doesn't actually go down all the way. So you've really got to create enough room for your entry to the third row. So we'll hop into here. Now, bring this down, click that into position, and then I've got a little lever here that allows me to pull that row back again, click that into position too. Okay, so the space is interesting because I've kind of got room, but I kind of don't. So, tow room is 
okay but not amazing. Knee room is compromised but you can kind of just lay back a little bit. It's my head that's just touching this roof line here that makes it a little uncomfortable. But for the most part, I think you could fit an adult in here fairly comfortably. You've got airbag coverage across the third row, which some of the uh, seven seat SUVs don't actually have. You have blower controls here for the third row, plus a 12 volt outlet and then storage either side as well. So it's actually not a bad place to be seated, even for an adult. Okay, cargo space, let's have a little sticky beak. So you've got a power tailgate. Wait for that one to open. Um, now, behind the third row, you have this storage area here. It's not massive, but they have integrated this system. So you have the base floor, which is where this sits most of the time. But if you pull this out and up, you can actually get a twin tiered floor. That means you can hide valuables under here without them being visible from the outside, which I think is a handy feature to have because these things may look very practical, but it is hard to hide your valuables there. Um, I'll drop this second, sorry, the third row now so you can see how much room there is. Once this is dropped, you have a little over 600 litres of cargo space available. Whack these bags in. So you can see here clearly that it's not a flat floor unless you raise that uh, load platform just there. So there's your space there with this third row down. Then what you can also do is drop the second row to increase the space to just under 2,000 litres. You have kind of a flat floor up until this point where it climbs a little bit. But keep in mind you can fold this so you actually have a little bit more space here. But because it's not flat, it's kind of slightly impractical. We've hit the road in the Rexton. Now, the interesting thing about this is, unlike a lot of manufacturers that will share engines, gearboxes with other manufacturers, Sangyong has developed this whole package in-house. So it's unique to this vehicle. It's a 2.2 litre turbocharged four-cylinder diesel engine. It makes 148 kilowatts of power and 441 newton metres of torque. And it's all mated to an eight-speed automatic transmission. Now, it is slightly down on some of the other competitors in this segment, especially things like Ford and uh, Toyota with the Fortuna, where they're sitting at that 500 newton metre mark. But for the most part, it actually feels nice and punchy behind the wheel and that eight speed is razor sharp too so if you do sink your boot into it it just gets up and moves it really doesn't hesitate at all barely any lag and it's just an impressive package what i did notice is when the auto hold is activated it can be a little funny off a standing start but outside of that it just feels really nice and competent sangyong claims a combined fuel economy of 8.7 liters per 100 k's we are currently sitting on, let's have a look here, 9.4 litres per 100 k's. Now, I've got a caveat for this, plus the other car we're filming today, which is the Range Rover. They've spent a fair bit of time idling. It was really cold this morning and the cars were just idling, so we didn't freeze to death. So this figure is probably closer to that nine or just under nine litres per 100 k mark, which is pretty impressive given that it is quite close to that official figure. Um, so yeah, big tick there in terms of fuel economy. Let's talk drive mode. So you've got three to pick from. You have winter, eco, and power. Uh, obviously the difference between those is your throttle response. Um, the steering doesn't feel like it changes a great deal as you move between those settings. Uh, and really, I mean, you get a bit more throttle sensitivity and power, but for the most part, they all feel kind of the same. There is an interesting point about the actual drivetrain though. So this is, in theory, a full-time two-wheel drive. So the Ford Everest, on the other hand, is a full-time four-wheel drive. The Pajero Sport can be driven in four-wheel drive on sealed surfaces. This, on the other hand, uses a ute-style system where it's two-wheel drive until you flick it to four high or four low, and you can't use four high or four low on sealed surfaces. So I'll explain why uh, when we do a little bit of off-road driving shortly. Sang Yong doesn't quote a zero to 100 time, but we've put it up against our stopwatch, and this is how it went. Let's talk handling, we're in power mode now. We'll throw it through a corner here. Let's see what it feels like. Look, it's not too bad. There is a little bit of body roll there, but the engine is really responsive and eager to please. Like it just sort of hooks up nicely and gets moving. Let's talk about the ride. So this is probably the thing that has surprised me the most. The ride is sensational. And when I say sensational, it's not a Rolls Royce, but in comparison to its peers, They've managed to sort out the ride so it's nice and smooth, especially on country roads where you're getting a lot of brittleness, corrugations, and these rough edges off the side of the road. It just handles it all really nicely and just cruises over everything without any dramas. And in and around the city, it's nice and smooth as well. There isn't that fuss that you get in some of the competitors. 
Then on the visibility front, very easy vision out the front there. Big wing mirrors. Uh, you've got a blind spot monitor built into the side there. Visibility out the back is okay. When you've got the third row up, it can be a little bit compromised because it's quite a narrow envelope. But for the most part, this is fairly easy to park given it has the front and rear parking sensors and the 360 camera as well. Another thing that surprised me here is road noise. It's quite a quiet and comfortable place to be seated. You don't really get a great deal of road noise from the tyres. You do get a little bit of wind noise from the side of the car, but it's incredibly quiet, uh, again, in comparison to some of the piers in this segment, which still feel very much like utes on stilts. Towing capacities are a bit like pissing contests. They're kind of pointless because, you know, you are realistically not going to tow to the full capacity all the time, especially if you're going to be carrying passengers and things inside the car. So when I say that this has a three and a half tonne towing capacity, it's impressive because the rest of the piers in this segment are either three tonnes or 3.1 tonnes. So it gives you a little bit more headroom, but I don't know that you'd realistically want to be towing three and a half tonnes behind really anything in this segment, regardless of whether they say you can actually tow that much. Turning circle comes in at 11 metres. Now, I don't know if that's a misprint because that is very tight for one of these. U turn here. Actually, you know what? I think that could be accurate because normally in these uh, big SUVs, we don't make that turn. So, pretty impressive they've been able to make it such a tight turning circle. Okay, let's talk about off road specifications. We'll do some light off roading. Now, I did mention in the last video that we published that I would create a new course for us. We have two different courses that we're going to use, whether it's wet or dry. So the wet course will involve Log Mountain. When it's wet, that's actually quite a challenge to get up because it relies on a decent traction control system and good tyres to make it all the way up. When it's dry, on the other hand, we have an uphill slope with some offset moguls that'll really put diff locks and traction control systems to the test. The reason I have one for wet, one for dry is with Log Mountain, when it's wet and the car slides backwards, I have lots of room for error and it won't hit anything. When we're on the other circuit, on the other hand, there isn't much room for error and behind it is a river. So I don't want to go into there, which is why we have the two set up. In between though, regardless of whether it's wet or dry, we'll be using a seesaw and then also an offset mogul. So the seesaw will be designed to give us a point in the middle where the body will be flexing and I'll be able to do the door test. We'll see how rigid the chassis is by opening and closing the door and seeing if anything catches. And then the offset mogul will tell us what the traction control system is like and also what the diff locks are like. Uh, a car without decent diff locks there is going to get stuck and will need to get pulled out, whereas one with decent diff locks or a decent traction control system should be able to work its way through. Now, onto the Rexton and the four-wheel drive features. So it has an approach angle of 20.5 degrees, which is the angle of the face you can approach before you hit anything, and a departure angle of 20.5 degrees, which is the same, but in reverse. You also have a low range transfer case. We have a four high mode, which is for use on unsealed surfaces, and then the four low mode, which is the low range transfer case. There is also a limited slip differential on the rear and that kicks in when there's 100 RPM of variation between the two rear wheels. So I'll be keen to see how that works. If you do want an explanation about what all that stuff means, click up here to watch our four wheel drive controls explained video. So let's pop it into four high. Given today is wet and these logs were extremely slippery at the moment because the tires just fill with mud really quickly. Uh, I'll be interested to see if it makes it up. It has dried out a little bit now given it's the afternoon, but it is still not very pleasant. We're in four high, we'll see if that factory LSD does a decent job. Here we go, rolling into it now. This is walking up here, about too many dramas. Hopefully I don't speak too soon. No, piece of cake. That is really impressive. That is really impressive. So the throttle is a tiny bit sensitive. Uh, when you roll into it, it kind of surges you with torque. So it could be worth using low range if you are sort of constantly doing this, but that walked up there with these. So we also have a hill descent control. I'll enable that now for our drive down on the sand. Let's see how that goes. Well, that is going way too quick. Um, okay, I'm gonna intervene there. Yeah, that's way too fast. So I've had to take over there because it's sort of just running away from us a little bit. Um, but yeah, okay, so tick for our uphill test. Let's head over to the seesaw and the offset mogul and see how it all works. Okay, time for the seesaw here. So this is going to whip us over to this side. There it goes there. And then it's going to whip us over to the other side as well. I'm gonna kill that parking sensor. There we go. So we'll get it over to the point now where it switches sides and we get a little bit of a seesaw in between. There it is just there. So the body is flexing now. Let's have a look at how rigid that is. That's actually not too bad. So. That's not catching at all. So big tick there. 
Let's continue on and we'll get to the offset mogul here. This is where we're going to get a real good idea of how, how well the traction control system and also that rear diff lock works. When we roll into here, we're going to have two tires off the ground, a little bit further. There it is, just there. So at this point right now, I'm just going to roll into the throttle and we should get a good understanding of what's going on with that rear diff lock. Okay, so here we go. It's not too bad. Now, the interesting thing is when I rolled onto the throttle, I could feel it shunt a little bit and that was the LSD coming into gear there. So it detected there was more than 100 RPM slip between the rear wheels. The LSD activates, locks the rear diff and then gives you that immediate propulsion. So that's a really impressive setup. It didn't have to rely on traction control to get out of there, which is what we find sometimes with dual cab utes and uh, SUVs that are based on dual cab utes. So Sangyong Rexton, let's put the company's issues to one side. This is a review of the product. I'll discuss the company in just a second. The product itself is actually good, surprisingly good. I was expecting it to be fairly average, but what they've been able to do is create a really smooth engine and make it drive just really nicely in comparison to some of the peers in this segment. Toyota Fortuna, for example, is way too firm. This basically does everything a Fortuna does, but for less money and also without breaking your back. And there are two grades there to pick from in terms of how much you want to spend. So it is really well equipped for the money. And uh, I just think it'll put a smile on your face if you do have to cart kids around. The downside though is the company's current situation. So obviously they're bankrupt at the moment. They're looking for a new owner. If they do find a new owner, I'd be confident in recommending it because in Australia, at least you get a seven year warranty. You've got a decent price there. And with three and a half tons of towing capacity, it exceeds the rest of the competitors in this segment. So let me know what you think in the comments section below. Are you buying this or are you going to buy something else and does the company's current financial situation worry you at all given how good the product is let me know what you think down there if you did enjoy this video make sure you share it with your mates and hit the like button as well and if you haven't done so already subscribe to our channel so you can find out every single time we publish something new but until next time drive safely